Amen, amen. Well, good morning, church. It's um, so good to have each and every one of you joining us online this morning. So thankful that we get to sing these songs of praise to God as we get to just declare the truth about who God is and what he has done. I want to share with you just a few ways that we are going to worship this morning. We worship through singing God's word. We're going to worship through studying his word. And also we're going to take a moment right now to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And that might sound a little strange since you are at home and not here. So we won't be passing a plate, but we'd encourage you at this time, go ahead as an act of worship, give to the Lord. You can write uh, a check and mail it to the church, or you can go online through our app or through our website and give online there as we continue to support um, the work of the Lord in this time. And so you can give specifically to our church. There's another thing you can give to as well. We have the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And what that offering supports is the North American Mission Board. It supports church planters and mission work here in America, in Canada, and it's something that's so incredibly important. We've set a goal of $12,500 for our church to raise for Annie Armstrong. You know, we went back and forth as a staff just talking about, well, nobody's going to be here. Everybody's going to be online. Should we reduce that goal? And we said, no, we prayed about it. We sought God's heart, and that was the amount that God placed on our hearts. So if you just think right now, there are so many church plants, there are missionaries in North America who are desperately needing this offering right now. I know church plants especially have been hit hard by this as they're having to pay rent for facilities they're not meeting in, other things like that. It's a difficult time. So we'd ask for you to prayerfully give to support missions in North America. One specific thing that's happening is there's something called Send Relief, and it's a way to step in when disaster happens and You know, the Southern Baptist Convention is so good at doing that. And this Annie Armstrong will go, Easter offering will go towards um, that project as well. So I really encourage you to pray about giving above and beyond your tithes and your offerings towards that Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And it's something this whole week is going to be a week of prayer for our church as we pray for missions here in North America. I just want to remind you, you can join us 7 p.m., Every night, Monday through Friday, as we have a time of prayer together, live on our Facebook page. I'd encourage you so much to join and participate in that, and we'll have a special emphasis as we pray this week, praying for missions in North America. I think we've all seen, as this uh, pandemic has hit, as our country has been hit hard, as we pray for places like New York, New Orleans, Chicago, Detroit, the way this virus is just really hitting some of those places, and we think we need God at work in our country. And our hope is that prayer time can be one where we can bring together our prayers and petitions to God. So we ask you to join online with us Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. It's just a 30-minute time of prayer. But what better response can we have to this pandemic than for us to pray together as a church family. And so as we speak about praying together, that's what I want us to do right now. I want us to pray. I want us to think about giving towards the church, giving to Annie Armstrong. And I want us to think about how we can pray and bring our prayers, our petitions to God. And even right now, if you're watching online, I'd encourage you, if you're on our Facebook page, just write in a prayer request if you have one. We have staff members that are monitoring those pages so we can know how best we can minister to you in this time. So if you have any prayer requests, any concern at all, please just write that in there on the Facebook page, and we promise you that we'll be praying right now as it is. Let's go to the Lord as we pray for our tithes and our offerings, as we pray for our country, as we pray for our time of worship this morning. God, we love you so much, and we're so thankful for the opportunity to gather together and worship And yes, Lord, we're gathering in our living rooms. Lord, we're gathering together virtually, but we're so thankful that your spirit, Lord, is with each and every one of us if we've made a decision to follow after you. So we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just remind us of the strength that we have together as a church family 
Lord, that you'd remind us of the unity that we have together as a church family. Lord, that you would remind us that though we might be socially distant, Lord, that we are still interconnected as the universal church, as the body of Christ at this time. So God, we pray specifically as people are, I know people are hurting right now in this economy, but we pray, Lord, that people would still give faithfully to your church and your mission. We pray specifically, Lord, right now for the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We pray for North American missions. We pray for all these church plants that are struggling and wondering if they'll have the funds to get their doors back open when this pandemic passes. Lord, we lift up each and every one of those situations to you. We pray, Lord, for our nation in particular. We pray this pandemic might be a wake-up call. It might drive us to our knees. It might drive us to you. Lord, we pray. Lord, we just sang the song, though we are prone to wander, Lord, prone to leave the God of love, we pray, Lord, that you'd take our hearts, you'd take and seal them, seal them for thy courts above. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you'd be with us so we have the opportunity to gather together and worship this morning. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be in chapter 6. We're going to look at just the first 14 verses of chapter 6 this morning. Just as a reminder of where we're at, where we're going in Nehemiah. Nehemiah, regular guy, had a regular job and felt this call from God to go back and rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Goes to his king, asks for over a decade off, asks for money to fund the project, asks for the king to change his own thoughts and ideas on foreign policy to help Nehemiah. And because God's hand was on Nehemiah, all of this comes to pass. Nehemiah is there in Jerusalem. They're all rebuilding the walls. Remember, they've gone through all these different issues and struggles, and Nehemiah has kept his team on task, and they've been working hard to rebuild the walls. And they just dealt with some internal struggle of some people trying to exploit them last week. If you remember last week, we talked about how in Nehemiah chapter 5, Nehemiah fought against exploitation and said in times of crisis and in times of trouble, rather than taking advantage of other people, what we need to do as a church is we need to selflessly serve others. And Nehemiah set that example of service, saying I'm not going to take what's owed to me as governor, and I'm not going to oppress the people more, but rather I'm going to give out of the abundance of what God has given me, and I'm going to help bless others and serve others. And we talked about how there's no greater example of humble service, because Nehemiah just is a, really a foreshadowing, pointing to Christ, who is willing to give it all for us. And so last week they dealt with internal struggle in chapter 5, and now we're going to see in chapter 6 that Nehemiah's opponents are going to change their tactics. And they're going to start trying to attack Nehemiah personally. You see, they wanted this building project to fail because they wanted Jerusalem to be weak. They didn't want Jerusalem to be strong. They didn't want the Israelites to be strong. And these opponents knew that they had to do something to try to distract Nehemiah, to try to put obstacles in his path. So it seems like just as they dealt with some internal issues, the previous chapter now, we're seeing it's coming again, these distractions coming from all around Nehemiah. And that's where we're at in Nehemiah chapter 6. I want to read the first nine verses of Nehemiah chapter 6. And this is what God's word says. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it, though at that time I had not installed the doors in the city gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. They were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease? when I leave it and go down to you four times 
they sent me the same rep- proposal and I gave them the same reply. Sanballat sent me this, se- this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations and Geshem agrees that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason you're building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf, there is a king in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king, so come, let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there's nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You're inventing them in your own mind, for they are all trying to intimidate us, saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. Let's pray. God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. We pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us through your word now. We're thankful for your son, Jesus, and the hope that we have in him. We pray, Lord, that you open up our hearts and our minds to be receptive to your word this morning. Pray you'd remove any distractions. God, you'd speak to us through your holy scriptures. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Nehemiah has to deal with yet another distraction. He has to deal with another distraction. Now, we all know that distractions happen to all of us. They happen to all of us. So, my beautiful 19-month-old daughter has just discovered the joy of running, and it is a lot of fun, and I love watching her run. It is cute, and it cracks me up, but one of the problems is she wants to run, but she wants you to chase her, and so as she starts to run, and her little feet pitter-patter, Instead of looking where she is going, what my daughter does is she often looks back to make sure that someone is chasing her. As you can imagine, there are issues that happen with my daughter. She's running into furniture. She's running into walls. She's tripping over things because she will not look where she is going. So it's been this game now when all of a sudden she starts to run. She thinks it's a lot of fun because Jill and I will sprint to try to grab her before she crashes into something. Luckily, there haven't been, you know, broken noses or bones yet. And, you know, her top speed is still low enough that any collision is pretty minor. But we're like, Avi, you've got to watch where you're going. You cannot be distracted. And what we see here is Nehemiah's, his opponents, they've decided we've got to figure something out. So we're going to try all these different ways to distract Nehemiah from the mission that he is on. We want to distract him. We all have issues with distraction. Maybe it's not running to walls by not looking where you're going, like my daughter, but we all have issues. I think that we all have issues specifically with this. It was really interesting. There was actually a St. Louis-based um, senior living community provider called Provision Living, and they did a study about smartphone usage. And one of our own companies did this extensive study, and do you know what they found out? The average American spends 5.4 hours a day on their phone. Now, before you say that's all just the younger generation, yes, millennials, it was 5.7 hours per day. But boomers... Many of them who complain about millennials on their phone, right? Boomers, it was an average of five hours per day. We can get distracted so easily by this. There's now all sorts of research. There's this book out called Deep Work and this idea of how our phone and multitasking has distracted us from going really deep and getting serious about the work that we need to do. This thing can be an incredible tool. In fact, I'd encourage some of you, as I'm just talking about cell phone usage, if you want to follow along with our outline, the best way for you to do that this morning is on our app, the outline is available. So we can use smartphones for good. You have the Bible app. I know so many people that are corresponding with friends in this era right now, these few weeks, or or hopefully just few weeks of social distancing where phones can be such a help to connect. 
with those that we love. But as we know, every good thing can become an idol. It can become a God thing. It can become dangerous if we overuse it and if we abuse it. And what this showed was over five hours a day on average, people turn to their cell phone. It's really easy, especially when you have notifications on, you hear the ping, and you stop whatever you're doing, you get distracted, and you focus on that. Sometimes, if the devil can't get you to sin, he wants to distract you by keeping you busy and getting you removed off the task that you have at hand. And so when you think about it as a church, one of the challenges that we have in this moment with social distancing and with things being so different from what we were used to just a few weeks ago, it's still strange to me right now to be preaching in an empty sanctuary. I want to see your faces in front of me. In fact, we all know that I like to walk around the stage. Well, one reason why I do is I like to walk and I like to zone and key in on people that I know are paying attention and find encouragement that way. So right now, I'm just going to have to pretend someone's right here and giving me an amen. And that's just how it goes. So I'll walk a little bit. I'll try to get more comfortable. It's just strange. It's strange times. But here's the deal. In the midst of of social distancing, our mission has not changed. We're still called to make disciples. We're still called to share the truth of the gospel. We're still called to live for Christ. Here at Fifi Baptist, we're still called to build and pursue, to build our lives on Jesus, to pursue the good of the community of those around us. We're still called to do all those things. So we have to be willing, like Nehemiah, to avoid distractions. To avoid distractions. This is what happens. Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, they get together. They're hearing that he's rebuilt the wall. There's no gaps. And they're saying, we've got to do something. Before they put up these doors, these gates, before it's all completely finished, we've got to get them on mission. So this is what they say. They send Nehemiah a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. And look what he says. They were planning to harm me. What we see is they are going to try to distract Nehemiah with subtle persuasion. They're playing really political softball here. This almost looks like a concession speech. Hey, Nehemiah, let's get together. Let's bury the hatchet. Everything will be okay. But this is what we have to understand. We need to be wary when people ask us to do things that make us neglect our responsibilities. Be wary when people ask you to do things that make you neglect your responsibilities. See if someone says, hey, I want your kid to be on this traveling team. Yes, you'll have to miss some on Sunday mornings, but that's okay. Well, it's our responsibility to gather together. So maybe we need to understand to be wary of some of those things. Sometimes when people call, say, come over here, do this or do that, we need to be wary when people ask you to do things that make you neglect your responsibilities. You see, he understands that though it looks like this is political soft, although it's, hey, it's a concession speech. Hey, Nehemiah, let's all get along. Let's be happy. Let's have no issues. Let's bury the hatchet. He sees right through it. Notice where they invite him. They invite him away from Jerusalem where the work is happening. They invite him to the valley of Ono. Now, Ono, we know, is located on the seacoast near the Gaza Strip. This would be the ancient Near East equivalent of a resort town. Hey, Nehemiah, let's go head to the beach and hang out while everybody else is finishing your work in Jerusalem. Neglect your responsibilities and come over here to Ono. So you know what Nehemiah said? He saw right through it and wait for it. Nehemiah said, oh no to oh no. I'm laughing. I hope some of you are laughing as well. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I may crack myself up. I appreciate my own dad jokes, okay? So Nehemiah said, I'm not going to do it. He says, I have these right priorities. Well, then look at this. He says, I'm not going to do it. I know they're planning to harm me. He sent the messengers. I love this. I'm doing important work. Basically, Nehemiah says, I don't have time for you. But this is the thing. Many times our 
critics, those people who are against us, they just want to distract us. They just want to get us off mission. We need to say, no, I need to stay focused on the mission that God has given me. Four times they sent me the same proposal, but I gave them the same reply. Four times. Nehemiah says, I know I'm doing what God has called me to do. And this is what we see. A life on mission is focused on the right priorities. A life on mission is focused on the right priorities. Nehemiah knew he was building the wall. He was doing what God had called him to do. So he was unwilling to get distracted. Though they were persistent. Four different times, they tell him, come on, let's meet together. Now, we all know this. Again, my wonderful toddler, she can be very, very persistent. One of her favorite things right now, she loves smoothies. So little yogurt smoothies, okay? She calls them movies because she can't say smoothie yet. But, and she knows I'm the weak one, okay? So she's allowed to have one smoothie a day. Okay, and she will just come up and daddy, and she looks at me with those big blue eyes, daddy, movie, daddy, movie. And I do like, Jill, has she had one yet? I don't know. Okay, you're going to get another one anyway. Okay, she can wear me down by just coming up and asking for those movies again and again and again. And that's what the devil wants to do with us. That's, that's how he gets us off mission. It's just continually, persistently attempting to distract us. So we need to stay focused on the right priorities. We need to not give in to peer pressure. Nehemiah knows these guys, they might have been important people, but they're outside of Jerusalem. They're outside of the work that he has done. So don't give in to the peer pressure. Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean you need to do it. Stay focused on the mission. And ultimately, as we say here, what we need to understand is everything that we're doing here at the church, we need to be all about building and pursuing. We want to build and we want to pursue. We want to do what God has called us to do. We stick with our priorities, build our lives on Jesus, pursue the good of the community where God has placed us. We cannot get distracted. We have to stay on mission. But I want you to notice what happens. When the political softball doesn't work, Sanballat and his buddies decide to play hardball. Verse 5, Sanballat sent me the same message a fifth time by his aide who had an open letter in his hand. What does this mean, an open letter? You see, in the ancient Near East, when you'd send a private letter, you'd seal that letter and it would have a, a wax seal on it so no one else could read it. Now, an open letter, remember these are very communal societies, an open letter, you'd send it to these different towns and everybody would read it. It wasn't made necessarily for just one person, but it's so the whole community could read it. And so what they do is they decide, we're going to put pressure on Nehemiah because we're going to make up lies about him. We're going to send this open letter that says, Nehemiah wants to be the king of Jerusalem. In other words, they're saying that Nehemiah is going to go against Artaxerxes, remember his boss, who funded him and supported him in rebuilding the walls. They're saying, Nehemiah doesn't care about Artaxerxes. He doesn't care about Persia. He wants for Jerusalem to become a kingdom again. And he wants to be king. So this is political hardball. This is when the rubber hits the road. What is Nehemiah going to do? Because they've been now they're lying on Lying about him, lying about his character, lying about his motivations. Look at verse 8. Here's his reply. Then I replied, there's nothing to these rumors you're spreading. You're inventing them in your own mind. And continues, for they all were trying to intimidate us, saying they'll drop their hands, they won't finish the work. And then Nehemiah does just a little prayer. Remember, throughout this book, we see that Nehemiah is a man of prayer. He prays without ceasing. He continues to go. So, and look at this, just this little prayer that he has in the midst of all the pressure of these rumors of him wondering what's going on. Is the king going to believe it? He says this, but now, my God, strengthen my hands. What we see here is when distractions come, we need to keep praying and we need to keep working. Keep praying and keep working. 
We need to pray hard. We need to work hard. Because this is, this is the truth. What we see is when you truly are living on fire for God, it puts you in Satan's crosshairs. When you're on mission for him, when you're on mission for the Lord, Satan wants to do anything he can to knock you off course. So you can't be surprised when trouble comes, when distractions come, when obstacles are put in your path. But Nehemiah responded to his enemies in three ways. His response is really threefold. First, he refuted the rumor. He said, there's nothing true about it. So he makes just a statement, hey, this isn't true. <clears throat> and then we see that he prayed to God and he kept on working. He prayed to God, and he kept on working. You see, Nehemiah knew they were on the last lap of the race. The wall was nearly completed, and now these people are doing whatever they can to knock him off course, to tell people Nehemiah's doing it for his own glory. Nehemiah's doing it for himself, to better himself. We just saw the previous chapter. He gave up some of the perks of being governor. He didn't take the food that was allotted to him and said out of his own blessings that God had given him, he fed other people. He took care of other people. He served other people. And so these lies are just that. They are lies. But what Nehemiah does is he took care of his character and he trusted God to take care of his reputation. So Nehemiah took care of his character. We can't always control our reputation, but we can control our character. We stay on mission for God. We live with integrity. We stay focused for him. And then we let God take care of our own reputations. He prays, God, strengthen my hands. God, don't let me get distracted by all this. God, let me stay on mission for you. There are times when we just get a little tired. And you know what? It's good that we can't do what God has called us to do in our own strength, because then we could get some of the credit, Right? Instead, like Nehemiah, we just need to pray to God. When we are feeling weak, we just need to say, God, strengthen my hands. Think about what Paul says, right? When he's praying, and he asks God to help him to remove the thorn in his side, and God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. When we are feeling weak, God can work miraculously in and through that if we'll just ask him to strengthen us. And then that'll be his spirit working in and through us. And ultimately, we see they, they're going to try one more thing. Verses 10 and following. I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mahadabel, who was restricted to his house. So he goes, this guy who's a prophet in his house. And he said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temples. Let's shut the temple doors because they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. Last thing we have to understand is you have to use the servant. So this is what happens. Sanballat and his buddies, Tobiah, Geshem, they go to this prophet. I'm guessing they probably hire him. They give him money, whatever it is, and they say, you need to tell him this, that Nehemiah needs to run and he needs to hide in the temple. And Nehemiah knows there are people who want him dead, who want this done. So there's some truth to this, right? But he said, let's go hide in the temple, shut the temple doors. But look at Nehemiah's response, verse 11. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I will not go. You know, I says, you're not going to catch me on that. I, he uses discernment, though this guy claims to be a prophet from God who says, I have this message for you. You go hide in the temple. Understand a little bit of Old Testament rules and rituals, right? He says this, verse 12, I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Timbalat and Sambal and Sambalat, Tobiah and Sambalat, excuse me, had hired him. He was hired so I'd be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin, and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. So this guy initially, he, the logic sounds good. Guys are coming to kill you, Nehemiah. Go hide in the temple, shut the doors, you'll be safe. Nehemiah knows that there are people out to get him. But Nehemiah detects something is wrong. See, in the Old Testament, the only people allowed to go into the temple were priests. 
And so what this prophet says is he says, Nehemiah, go against God's word to protect yourself. Go against God's word to save yourself. So we need to use the sermon. Even if it sounds good, we test it against God's word. Even if it sounds good, we test it against God's word. God will never ask you to do anything that is contrary to his word. He'll never ask you to do anything that's contrary to, your, to his word. My boyfriend asked me to move in with him. Very simple. That's not from God, okay? It's against God's word. Oh man, I have, I have a lot of bills. I'm not sure how I'm going to pay for them. Maybe I can just take a little extra from my company just to take care of my family. I can pay it back later. I just need a little bit more. Surely God would be okay if I pay it back later. No, we never, God will never want us to do anything that is contrary to his word. So Nehemiah knew, getting a regular guy, but he knew his Bible well enough to say, hey, this thing that you're asking me to do, I can't do it. It is against God's word. You're, kind of, you're trying to discredit me. You're going to say, look, this guy says he's living for God, but now he's going in against, the, against the Bible and hiding in the temple. You're just out to discredit me. So Nehemiah uses discernment. And this is what he does. Look at verse 14. This is how we'll end. This is another prayer. This one is a little interesting. But my God, remember Tobiah and Sinbalat for what they have done, and also the prophetess Noadiah and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. So Nehemiah is incredibly frustrated. So what does he do? Does he attack these guys back? No. When he is frustrated, he takes it to God. When we are frustrated, we need to take it to God. Remember what we said last week, when someone talks about you, don't talk back, talk to God. When we're upset, when we don't understand everything that's happening, when we are frustrated, we go to God. We go to God. We see this time and time again in Scripture. When distractions come, people go and they focus on God. They bring their frustrations to God. They seek after him in order to stay on mission. And ultimately, we stay on mission by surrendering daily to God, by saying yes to his priorities and no to any distractions. Even in this time, you know, in this time of social distancing, we have a lot of time at home. We could use that time to start really spending time reading God's word. We can use that time to reach out to friends who we know know need hope and encouragement. Or we can use that time to binge Netflix. How are we going to redeem the time that God has given us? We stay on mission by surrendering daily God, saying it's not my will but yours. There's no greater example of this than Christ. Remember, he got away, got alone with God the night before he was to be crucified, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed and sought God. Though he was offered multiple opportunities to walk away from the cross, to take the easy way out, though the enemy offered him so many different options that he wouldn't go to the cross, Jesus stayed on mission for you and for me. When he was accused, when he was mocked, he kept his eyes on the cross. And the way he kept his eyes on the cross is he focused on the mission that God had given him. He endured the cross so that you and I might be saved, so that God might get the glory. Whatever we're walking through, we stay on mission. We stay focused. In our weakness, God can be strong. And we walk through it by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So we look to Christ. We see his example. We see the example of Nehemiah. 
who avoids distraction. And ultimately, in the midst of all of that, we understand that we can't do it on our own, in our own strength. So we pray like Nehemiah had prayed, God, strengthen my hands. And in this time where we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, we're just adjusting to a new normal. How important is it for you and for me, for each and every one of us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to stay on mission for God? We can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. We can't do it in our own power. But we can, like Nehemiah, ask God to strengthen our hands. Would you just pray that with me this next week? When things get difficult, remember this little prayer of Nehemiah. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. I believe if we pray to God, if we seek after him, that God will give us the strength that we need to live out the mission that he's called each and every one of us to do. I want to pray as we close our time together. But before I do, as I shared about what Jesus did for us, how he stayed focused on mission, how he went to the cross for you and for me. Maybe you've tuned in. I don't know why you got onto this stream this morning, but maybe you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. I'd encourage you right now to consider what Christ did for you, what Christ did for me. And what I want you to do is I want you just to consider giving your heart and your life to him even now. We have staff members on our Facebook page who are ready to interact. You can send us a message. You can send me an email, just zach at fifibc.org. We'd love to talk with you and pray with you about what it means to follow Jesus. We all need God's strength in this time. Let's avoid all the distractions. Let's put the phone down. Not have to spend five hours a day on it. Let's focus on on God and the work that he's called each and every one of us to do. I just pray you'll look to God this next week. Let's go to him in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're thankful for your word. God, we are so thankful that we can go to you at any time. God, we pray right now that we would not let distractions Lord, take our eyes off of you, but instead, Lord, we'd stay on mission. Lord, that we'd be building and pursuing for your name and for your glory. God, we pray right now that you would strengthen our hands, that we don't always know what to do. God, I pray that we'd humble ourselves, seek your face, and be willing to live on mission for you. God, we pray if there's anyone right now online who's listening to this, who's never made a decision to follow you, I pray, Lord Jesus, your spirit would be at work in their hearts even now. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for this opportunity we have to gather together in worship. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.